Well, uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, for those who don't know me, my name is Matt Rojanski. Uh, I'm the director here at the Kennan Institute. Um, in the in the presence of our founding director, uh, Dr. Fred Starr, it's uh, a particular honor to be able to say that. I, I think I'm number seven in line. Um, we're also honored to, to be joined today by Larissa Glad, uh, widow of, uh, of, of past director John Glad, 1982 to 83. Um, so it's a it's really a, a storied uh, community here, um, one I'm so proud to be a part of. Uh, but our focus, of course, uh, shifts to an area that has been of um, great interest uh, to Fred throughout his career, uh, to the Kennan Institute. I would say not as much as it should have been, um, but very much increasingly this year, and that's Central Asia. Um, actually, Fred was here a couple of years ago. Um, actually more than a couple now, I think. It was probably my first year as director, so 2013 or 14, to talk about your magnum opus on Central Asia. Um, and that was, that was really an, uh, an epic presentation. I think I used the word tour de force at the time, but I feel like you sort of have coined that phenomenon, so it should be called a tour de Fred. Um, <laughs> I, I, I expect nothing less today. Um, we'll have a, a, a nice chance for a Q&A discussion afterwards and then a reception. So it's a, it's a great evening to launch uh, what I would call kind of the scholarly side of our Year of Central Asia programming. Um, we last night had a launch of the um, culture and, and entertainment side with uh, a film uh, from Uzbekistan called Islam Khoja um, and a discussion with the director. Uh, as well as with the uh, Uzbek ambassador. Um, of course, there's no one better uh, to give a lecture provocatively titled, uh, Is Russia Becoming Central Asia's Near Abroad? Um, because Fred, I think, can actually deliver on uh, the promised challenge. Um, he is a renowned historian, the historian, one might say, expert and specialist on developments in Central Asia, the Caucasus, and Russia, uh, and the broader former Soviet region. Um, Fred is uh, in, in every way a longtime friend of the Kennan Institute, um, together with uh, Ambassador Kennan himself, uh, and then uh, Wilson Center Director uh, Dr. Jim Billington, subsequently Librarian of Congress. Uh, he co-founded the Kennan Institute here in 1974. It was the first uh, of the Wilson Center's programs. Uh, it remains the largest uh, Wilson Center regional program, is obviously a tremendous part of the Center's uh, brand and impact. Um, it's very fitting, actually, to have Fred back here as we are celebrating the 50th anniversary of the Wilson Center's creation right now, this month, October uh, of 1968, so October of 2018. Um, Fred was director of the Kennan Institute from 1975 uh, to 1980. Um, he really opened the door to research opportunities and programming that went outside of Moscow, which was a really unusual feature uh, for an American institution fo focusing on uh, the then Soviet Union, uh, and that is a great credit to Fred's leadership. Um, I am not going to uh, say anything about, about Fred's lect lecture topic, let it speak for itself, but uh, just to give you a little uh, background about this uh, impressive and intimidating figure who I've had the honor to, to follow uh, as number seven in line, he's the founding chairman now of the Central Asia Caucasus Institute and Silk Road Studies Program. Uh, a joint transatlantic research and policy center now affiliated with the American uh, Foreign Policy Council here in Washington. It's good to have Herman Pershner from AFPC with us as well. Um, and uh, the, he's also affiliated with the Institute for Security and Development Policy in Stockholm. Um, he is a distinguished fellow for Eurasia at AFPC uh, and a frequent commenter on affairs in the region, uh, having authored uh, countless articles in distinguished journals like Foreign Affairs, The National Review, Far East Economic Review, uh, and opinion pieces in a great many American and international newspapers. Um, the uh, monograph of which I spoke earlier, Lost Enlightenment, Central Asia's Golden Age from the Arab Conquest to Tamerlane, um, is his uh, second to last book. Uh, the most recent one being Uzbekistan's New Face, which should be out now? Thursday. Thursday, okay, very good. So <laughs> you should be able to purchase that very soon. Um, and I think very timely indeed, given, given what is happening in Uzbekistan and the region. Uh, it, it really is. It's a, it's a very exciting moment uh, to bring the kind of focus that Fred can for us. So I, I would encourage you to engage him 
uh, in, in uh, a, a broad conversation about the region as well as uh, uh, the topic of his lecture. Um, he left the Kennan Institute, I'm, I'm sure only reluctantly, uh, to serve as uh, vice president of Tulane University uh, and president of the Aspen Institute and of Oberlin College. So a great many very distinguished leadership positions. Um, he's, he's been closely involved uh, in the University of Central Asia and the Azerbaijan Diplomatic Academy, is a trustee of Nazarbayev University in Kazakhstan. Um, his education uh, included a, a bachelor's at Yale uh, and a master's at King's College, Cambridge, and a PhD uh, at Princeton. I hold none of those things against him, uh, but uh, am, uh, let's, let's say, only partially impressed. As, as a Harvard man, I always feel I have to throw something to the, uh, the Princeton and Yale crowd. But um, he, uh, he's a, a, a distinguished uh, and a noted jazz, jazz musician and, and expert, a founding member of the Louisiana Repertory Jazz Ensemble of New Orleans uh, and uh, founder of the Greater New Orleans Foundation, um, and is the, which is the single largest non-governmental sponsor of post-Katrina recovery in that city. So um, it's a real pleasure to welcome uh, Dr. Fred Starr again to our stage. Uh, Fred, it's up to you whether you want to sit or stand. Okay. Um, and then uh, Dr. Will Pomerantz, our Deputy Director, will lead the Q&A afterwards. So please. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you very much. That's very generous. It's really an honor for me to be speaking here today and see many old friends among you. Uh, for the 12 years during which we planned and, and, and then founded this institute, and then, the, and then the years after that, George Kennan and I were in very frequent contact. He often napped at, on my couch in the Smithsonian's castle building where we were at the outset. When I left New Orleans, for New Orleans, he presented me with a long poem about me that he had written in his eminently correct, if somewhat stilted, Russian. I treasure that moment of our friendship. Early on, we discovered that in the 1870s, his great uncle and namesake, George Kennan, and my great grandfather were neighbors in the pretty Ohio town of Norwalk. When I was in Oberlin, he and I visited Norwalk together. After several times, he and his, and also several times, he and his wife, Annalise, danced to my band from New Orleans when we performed in Princeton. He played guitar, by the way, and always regretted that he had not devoted more time to music. Now, George Kennan showed little or no interest in the non-Russian parts of the Soviet empire. But it came to me naturally, having begun my career doing archaeological work and mapping ancient roads in Turkey. Even though I loved my studies on Russian political thought and on Russian architecture and town planning, when the USSR collapsed, I felt the world would be oversupplied with Soviet specialists and, the, uh, and undersupplied with people who knew anything about the newly independent states, especially in Central Asia. So I shifted my focus. Now, President Putin, and hence Russia's attitude toward Central Asia, is no secret. He called the collapse of the USSR the greatest geopolitical tragedy of the 20th century. He left, it left Putin with the greatest geopolitical hangover of the 21st century. Consider how de Gaulle handled a similar situation. Unlike the non-Russian republics, which were just that, Algeria was an integral part of France. But after bloody fighting, de Gaulle, de Gaulle declared that he envisioned a better France without Algeria. France went on to a generation of prosperity. Putin, by contrast, might be called the anti-de Gaulle. He did exactly the opposite, and we're paying for it. Are we talking here just about Putin or about something deep in, deeper in Russian culture? This plunges us immediately into the character of Russian pheno Russia's phenomenal expansion beginning in the 15th century and of Russian nationalism the, and of Russian colonialism. Historians have long recognized that Russian expansion involved several distinct phases. The first was defined, according to Russian ideologists, by the open terrain of the easternmost reaches of Europe. 
Again and again, Russia was tempted to attack across these open lands and claim them as bulwarks for its own security. This, at least, is how most Russians viewed their actions. Those on the other side were quick to point out, however, that Russia was forging its own security at the price of the insecurity of its neighbors. Or, as Catherine II herself put it, I have no way to defend my frontiers other than to expand them. The second theme of Russian expansion was to take advantage of geopolitical vacuums created by dying empires or states consumed by domestic weakness or on its periphery. As Kennan put it, Russia exercised constant fluid pressure on its neighbors. This motive can be detected in the seizure of territories from Poland, Lithuania, Turkey, and Persia, territories that include Belarus, Ukraine, and Crimea, as well as the Caucasus. It extends down to the collapse of the Third Reich and the attacks on Persian Azerbaijan and Xinjiang in China in 1945. A third theme, expansion to preempt another major power, came prominently to the fore in the 18th century and was often used as a pretext for seizing territory. This was a key factor in Russia's decade-long effort to check European aspirations against Turkey and by putting the cross of St. Vladimir atop the Hagia Sophia. The fourth and final theme, expansion motivated by the by a desire for economic gain, did not really appear until Peter the Great seized territory from the Baltic states and Swedish, rule, Swedish ruled Finland in order to build a commercial port and capital at St. Petersburg. Most of the workmen, by the way, who perished while building that capital were Finns. So how does Central Asia fit into this picture? In attacking the Khanates of Kokan, Uhara, and Hiva, Russia believed that it was taking natural advantage of a vacuum left by dying regimes. Never mind that Kokan had ruled most of Central Asia and parts of Xinjiang until Russia took over in 1868. Without considering niceties of legitimacy, Russia concluded that all three Khanates were hollow shells that were ripe for the taking. It also was concerned to preempt British India, which it wrongly believed was poised to seize the Khanates. Finally, the British blockade of southern ports, southern American ports, during the Amer Civil War created an opening for Russia's cloth merchants in Ivanova to expand on the basis of cotton from Central Asia. The fact that all four of the historical motivations for expansion were present in the case of Central Asia does not mean that Russians considered that project to be all that important. True, cotton merchants and their friends in Moscow were solidly behind it. So was the military, which saw campaigns in Central Asia as a way of recouping its glory after the humiliating defeat in the Crimea. Russia's conquest of Central Asia was, above all, a project of the Russian military and of its friends in commercial Moscow. The conquest of Central Asia elicited little of the enthusiasm that had accompanied the campaign in the Caucasus earlier in the 19th century. There, were little public, there was little public excitement when the army successfully attacked Tashkent's northern gate in 1865, or when it took Samarkand in 1868. Contrary to all their assumptions about British aspirations, London responded to Russia's campaign against Central Asia with near silence. Neither Russian writers, artists, nor musicians built up a head of steam over these new conquests. The Caucasus campaigns had elicited major works from Lermontov, Pushkin, young Tolstoy and others. Yes, a few bombastic tracks appeared with the Central Asia campaign, but these were significant and forgettable. Artists were similarly indifferent. The great painter Vasily Vyshagin traveled to Central Asia and painted scores of canvases there. 
But for all his talent, Vereshchagin merely transferred to the Uzbek lands the exotic images which his teacher, Jean-Léon Jérôme, had drawn in French Algeria. It is true that Vereshchagin was initially subsidized by the war ministry and that he did half a dozen oils and drawings showing bloodthirsty scenes involving Uzbek and Turkmen fighters. A genuine patriot, uh, he also embraced the concept of Russia as a civilizing force in the primitive Muslim lands to the south. This is clear in his 1868 painting entitled The Triumph, showing Central Asian warriors besides a mound of skulls. He paired this with a second painting entitled Failure, which show a Russian soldier nonchalantly lighting a pipe as he stands over the bodies of our dead uh, Central Asians. A similar representation of Russia as a stabilizer can be found in Borodin's In the Steps of Central Asia, in which the composer presents the sounds of a Turkic caravan crossing the desert under the benign protection of the Russian army. However, both the nationalistic paintings of Vitoshagan and Baradin's musical sketch of the steppes have the mark of commissioned works, which they were. By the war ministry, the war ministry, rimsky korsakovs Scheherazade also breathes exotica, but it evokes not Central Asia, but Baghdad, as depicted in the Thousand and One Night. Now, where Vitoshagan was at his best, was in his dozens of paintings and sketches of ordinary Uzbek and Turkmen men and women, all portraits of the highest order, gorgeous things, and in his, in his precise yet evocative oils of regional architecture. These paintings were not commissioned by the army. His heart was in these serenely exotic works, which are as lacking in Russian chauvinism as his later works from India and Japan. Russia's conquest of Central Asia may have combined the motives mo of, for all its previous conquests, but it lacked the single-minded passion that had accompanied the conquest of the Caucasus and of Ukraine. The Caucasus appeared to Russians as a land of indigenous good guys and some fierce but often noble bad guys. The former to be granted Russian nobility, and at least some of the latter, for instance, Shamil and Haji Murat, to be given honorable exiles at, a, exile at the Tsar's expense. By contrast, few Russians showed any sympathy, sympathy for Central Asians, good or bad, or for Central Asia itself. To be sure, the conquest of Central Asia did inspire a few polemical works, including Dostoevsky's Gurktepe, What is Asia to Us? Gurktepe is, is where first a Turkmen army destroyed a Russian army, and the Russians came back and destroyed the Turkmen army, killing, I think, 15,000 people. Uh, Gurktepe, what is Asia to us, was Dostoevsky's, one of his last essays, in which he complained about, complained that after trying for two centuries to be Europeans, Russians had become merely windbags and idlers, but that, and I quote, with our push towards Asia, we will have a renewed upsur upsurge of spirit and strength. But most pan-Slavs of the era focused their attention not on Central Asia, but on Central Europe. Take a listen to Tchaikovsky's bombastic Marsh Slav. To be sure, Russians did develop expertise on the region. The Academy of Sciences sent several expeditions there, which produced invaluable research. Carl Gustav Mannerheim, the future president of Finland, traveled there as a kind of spy on one of these research trips, and later delivered a very upbeat report to the general staff. And there were a few individuals, like the novelist Dostoevsky, who during a five-year forced military service in Kazakhstan came to value the friendship of the Kazakh ethnographer and historian Shogun Velikanov. But far more typical was the Russified German Vasily Barthold, 
who was a highly sophisticated scholar at St. Petersburg University, who devoted his life to the study of Central Asian history. Bartol's works are still of great value. I revere his research. But Bartol's prejudice against Turkic peoples, whom he accused of destroying high culture while producing little of their own, was all too typical of him and of Russian scholarship at that time. Particularly virulent was the military's hatred for nomads, which spread to a large part of the population. Officers had not forgotten that Turkmen nomads had destroyed an entire Russian army in 1879. Retribution came the following year when the Tsarist forces killed those 14,000 14, uh, nomads at Gürtepe. It is no wonder that even in Soviet times, Turkmenistan ranked last among all the republics in terms of most economic and social indicators. A generation after Gürtepe, the Russian army took on Kyrgyz and Cossack nomads who opposed the Tsarist draft for World War I. By the end of this forgotten war, a third of all Kyrgyz had died, either in the fighting or while trying to flee across the snow, icy mountains into, into Xinjiang, China. Then, a decade and a half later, Stalin's bureaucrats and the Red Army, facilitated by the famine of 1930 to 33, caused the deaths of fully a third of the entire Kazakh population. Whatever the Central Asian's outward show of comity toward Moscow today, the memory of these and other ghastly sufferings remains alive and is part of the mentality of most families and of the region as a whole. During the 1920s, a new attitude toward Central Asia rose, mainly among a small band of Russian emigre nationalist intellectuals gathered in Prague. A brilliant lot, they came up with the notion that Russia's destiny was not in Europe, where it had just fought a war that had destroyed the Tsarist regime, but in what they called Eurasia. They coined the term. The term was evocative, yet no one was quite sure where this Eurasia existed on the map. One of their numbers, who later quit the group, Father George Florovsky, with whom I once had the honor of studying, said they asked the right questions but came up with the wrong answers. For 70 years, the ideas of these and other Eurasianists floated on the margins of Russian intellectual life. After the collapse of the USSR, however, a brilliant young thinker who was also an ardent anti-communist, Alexander Dugin, received and revived and repackaged the Eurasianist ideas and immediately found an eager audience for them among senior army officers. I know Dugan well, as he spent a week in Washington as the guest of our Central Asia Caucasus Institute. He and I spent every morning and early afternoon walking and talking. On Russian domestic matters, I found him to be rational and interesting. The heir of generations of old believers, he ardently opposed all forms of centralization and, and championed the independence of society against the state. But when he got to, be, got to Russia's border, everything changed. Like a 17th century Muscovite, he despised those whom he called Catholics, who turned out to be most Europeans. Russia, he preached, was an orthodox country, that's with a small o, and as such, had much more in common with those whom he called Orthodox Muslims and or even Orthodox Hindus than with the West. In short, he viewed Russia as Eastern and Southern with natural links with Turkey, Iran, and India, and Central Asia. To my surprise at that time, now many years ago, Dugan expressed no particular rancor toward the America and indeed took an interest in everything he saw here. I thought at the time of his visit that Dugan 
and apparently many other Russians, suffered literally from nostalgia. It's a modern term. It was only coined a couple of hundred years ago. It combines the Greek nostos, which means homecoming, and algos, which is, means ache. Ache, home, uh, an ache, ache of homecoming. In other words, many Russians ache with nostalgia, but no, don't know where they can feel at home. There is much debate as to whether and how much Dugin influenced Putin. Clearly, though, Putin, too, suffers from the same nostalgia, and he acts upon it. When in the 1990s the Central Asians formed a kind of regional union, Putin demanded to be included as an observer. Two years later, he demanded to be a full member, and then he closed it down, merging it into what became his Eurasian Economic Union. Immediately after 9-11, Putin uh, laid out his position on Central Asia. He, in, in phone conversations with every Central Asian president, and I verified this with every one of them or their number twos, he told them that they had no right to deal with the Americans without first receiving his okay. Unfortunately for Putin, the Central Asians were also in touch with an emerging China. First in the economy and eventually even in the area of security, China gently but firmly began nudging Russia to one side. Kazakhstan's Chinese-speaking foreign minister at the time, Kazim Jomart Takayev, adroitly proposed to use China as a balance to Russia. A few years later, he was to seek to balance both Russia and China with the United States and Europe. Soon, all the Central Asian countries had developed their own version of Takayev's tactic. By these means, they not only <coughs> hedge, uh, hedged in Putin, but accomplished this while maintaining correct and outwardly cordial relations with Moscow. Meanwhile, Moscow's imperial shadow in the region was fading just as happened in other post-colonial countries. Kazakhstan had become two-thirds Slavic by 1990, but massive emigration ha had left it, it now four-fifths four Kazakh today. The other Central Asian countries have experienced similarly massive outflows of Russians and Ukrainians. Kazakhstan, which had no choice but to join Putin's Eurasia Economic Union, made the study of English universe universal, and reduced Russian to the status of a medium for inter-ethnic communication. The new, the new university, named for Nazarbayev, on which I served as a trustee, adopted English, not Russian, as the language of instruction. The new, uh, other new institutions in the region, the uh, American University in Kyrgyzstan, the Central Asia uh, University of Central Asia in Kazakhstan, Tajikistan, and, Kyrgyz uh, and Kyrgyzstan, which I did a lot of planning work for, uh, also use English as a language of instruction, as this ADA university in, in, in Baku. Where, when Uzbekistan's new president, Mirzioyev, addressed a formal dinner in Washington last January, he spoke in Uzbek, not in Russian. And my big book on the region, Lost Enlightenment, has been translated into every Central Asian language by the Central Asians themselves, including, by the way, Dari, Push, Pashtun, and Uyghur. Information is following the same pattern. A decade ago, Central Asians' main window to the world was through Russian television and other media. Local language newspapers relied heavily on Russian news sources. Today, the internet is opening new horizons, local language publications are multiplying, and the regional presidents are discussing expanding their own region-wide media. To be sure, thousands of Central Asians still go to universities in Russia, but the older, deeply Russified generation is passing from the scene to be replaced by men and women with more cosmopolitan contacts and outlooks. It's all too easy to overlook the subtlety and effectiveness 
with which Central Asians managed their geopolitics. Notwithstanding the genocidal fate of Kyrgyz and Kazakhs at the hands of the Russian Tsarist and Soviet armies, and in spite of the massive and often corrupt economic and political pressures from their northern neighbor today, they have all preserved correct relations with Moscow, even while adroitly seeking to maximize their own sovereign prerogatives. This is not new. During Soviet times, the Communist Party the first secretaries of the Communist parties of the five Central Asian states were in constant phone contact with each other in order to coordinate their efforts. During the decades from the 1960s to the 1980s, they consulted daily on how to handle Moscow's demands. This region-wide show of independence took place under the leadership of Saraf Rashidov, first secretary of the Communist Party of Uzbekistan. The late uh, Turdakun Usubaliyev, who was Kyrgyz's first secretary at that time, told me that in the end, the Russians just gave up. Unless they were prepared to call in the army, he said they had no choice but to allow the Central Asians to manage their own affairs, provided they turned over to Moscow the cotton, uranium, meat, and fruits they demanded. This important reality, this is a major point, this important reality of their consultation, of their, their coordination in Soviet times confirms that the Central Asian autonomy and self-government has far deeper roots than has generally been recognized. During the first years after independence, every Central Asian state strove to confirm its identity by contrasting it itself to everyone else. And so we got the cults of Tamerlane, that great humanitarian in Uzbekistan, Manas in Kyrgyzstan, if he exi existed or not, we don't know, the Samanids in Tajikistan arguing with the Uzbeks whether the Samanids are ours or yours, uh, and uh, Abai in Kazakhstan, and also, let's not forget, Sultan Sanjar, the last uh, uh, sultan in Turkmenistan. Now, it, lest we snicker at all this, uh, let, let's recall that after the American Revolution, Noah Webster sat up there. It, it, he had a round, circular, donut-shaped desk in New Haven, and, and he was in the middle of that, Donut, and, and he, was, he was preparing the dictionary of the American language. The American language? Thought it was English. No, it was the American language, very much like the Central Asians uh, after 1991. By 2010, all of the regional states had survived and consolidated. Even the poorest of them, Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan, could look forward to future income, in their case, from selling hydroelectric power to Afghanistan and Pakistan via the CASA 1000 project. All this brought greater confidence and a greater willingness to interact with neighbors. Beginning in 2014, Putin's Eurasian Economic Union was putting pressure on all these Central Asians, which only strengthened their desire to consult with one another. It also encouraged some of them, especially the Uzbeks, to get on with reform. The astonishing reform project going forth in Uzbekistan today has deep roots in the Karimov era, by the way, when President Karimov quietly allowed his prime minister, Mirziyoyev, to start scoping out reforms in several fields. The full range of the Mirziyoyev reform program is absolutely stunning, well beyond that undertaken by the government of any other Muslim society. Since these reforms are detailed in our new book, Uzbekistan's New Face, I will not enumerate them here. What concerns us, though, is that they feature, first of all, the total reversal of Uzbekistan's policy of holding it its neighbors at arm's length. Instead, Tashkent has launched a comprehensive outreach to all of its Central Asian neighbors, including Afghanistan. 
It has delineated all disputed borders, open borders to cross-border transportation and trade, removed checkpoints that hinder trade, allowed Uzbeks to invest abroad and receive investments from abroad, and significantly made their currency easily convertible. Uzbekistan has also mounted region-wide conferences on sensitive topics like water and Afghanistan. No major, no major power played any role in planning or sponsoring these initiatives. The cooperative spirit of these ventures is, is embodied in the first call to renew meetings of the regional presidents, <coughs> which, by the way, now include as a full member of Central Asia, Afghanistan and President Ghani. Uh, this was proposed initially by President Mirziyoyev of Uzbekistan. President Nazarbayev of Kazakhstan said, that's a great idea, let's do it. He said, I'll issue the invitation, but I'll do it in your name because it was your idea. That's the kind of cooperation you're seeing right, left, and center today across the region. One of the central focuses of the new region-wide current of thought has been to reclaim Central Asians' common past. To be sure, Soviet scholars did do valuable work on Central Asian history, but their focus on details rather than the picture, that, than, rather than the big picture, assured that the larger history was never captured in print. This prompted me to attempt to pull the whole story together, which resulted in my lost enlightenment on Central Asia's golden age. My thesis was simple, that for half a millennium, Central Asia had been the center of the world. Placed in direct contact with all the great centers in the Middle East, China, India, and Europe, its merchants, and by the way, not the Chinese, organized and managed the so-called Silk Road between India, China, and the Middle East. The Chinese brought goods to the border, dumped them there. Central Asians picked them up. They opened the bags to see what was going in which direction, you know, and, and took advantage of it. They also minted most of the currencies in which the trade was conducted, which made them wealthy. In 1200, re, year 1200, regional cities like Merv in present-day Turkmenistan were the largest and richest on earth. Besides being trading hubs, these cities were centers of manufacturing. No one talks about it. They think Silk Road was just, was just hauling stuff from Europe to, India, uh, to China or vice versa or to India. No, it was the, the, the people in Central Asia were dominating it with their own manufacturers. They, for example, reinvented paper. Uh, they saw the product the Chinese were sending, which was made of bamboo and hemp and things like that, uh, and said, we, we, we can do this better. Let's, let's make paper out of our ample supply of fiber because we grow so much cotton. They really reinvented paper. And throughout the Middle Ages, it was paper from Central Asia that you will find in all the best Documents in any European archive or in any Middle Eastern archive are also on Central Asian paper. They also invented crucible steel, which we know as Damascus steel. No, it was Central Asian. It was invent that was discovered in the in Afghanistan on the long, down near the border of Pakistan, and the Central Asians were very quick to exploit it as a manufacturing product. And they also exported masses of printed fabrics in every direction. No less important, the rulers and wealthy elites of cities like Bukhara, Merv, Gurgansh, and Balkh generously supported culture. Avasema from Bukhara wrote the canon of medicine that became the standard text in European medical schools down to the 17th century. al Harezmi from Gurgansh in Turkmenistan gave algebra its name and is remembered in the term algorithm, which is, by the way, a corruption of al Khwarezmi's name. We, <laughs> very contemporary stuff. 
Omar Hayam from Nishapur, that's on the very eastern border of Iran, that's that part of eastern Iran that is Central Asia. Um, uh, uh, Omar Hayam from Nishapur developed trigonometry and sign law and came close to devising a non-Euclidean geometry. And by the way, yes, this is the gay, same guy whose who's poetry it is so widely read today. Al-Farabi from present-day Kazakhstan became the world's chief expounder of Aristotle's writings and the source to whom uh, Thomas Aquinas and other Western thinkers turned for wisdom. Finally, there is the great Biruni who worked in Afghanistan. He was born in Uzbekistan, worked in Afghanistan, Pakistan, mainly in Afghanistan, Biruni measured the circumference of the earth more accurately than anyone until the 17th century. He opened the possibility of world history by combining the calendars of every culture and tracing each of these calendar systems to the astronomical assumptions on which they were based. He then uh, uh, was able to come up with a, a single world uh, history. A, a single calendar system for the entire world, the first to do it. He invented world history. Uh, he also invented the concept of sp specific gravity and constructed a machine for measuring specific gravity that was accurate to three decimal points. Uh, and finally, Biruni, working in Ghazni in Afghanistan, hypothesized the existence of North and South America as inhabited continents, all by the year 1035. In short, besides its riches, Central Asia was the intellectual center of the world. So why don't we know this? The answer is simple, because most of these people wrote in Arabic the way Europeans uh, uh, wrote in Latin. Uh, but they weren't uh, Arabs. Uh, we assume that they, because they wrote in Arabic, they were Arab, Arabs, but they weren't any more than an Englishman writing in Latin was a, was a Roman, or a Japanese writing in English was, a, was an Englishman. Um, no, it was that the uh, Central Asians, rather than the Arab, more than the Arab world, were responsible for the so-called rena Islamic Renaissance a thousand years ago. They've never been given credit for this. What a contrast is all this to those blood-filled paintings the Tsarist army commissioned from Virushagin. Having been reminded of their own history, Central Asians are now busy reclaiming their past, a story of close regional interaction among diverse Turkic and Persianate peoples. Is this what Dugan and also many in this city call Eurasia? President Nazarbayev, in a meeting in 2017, criticized Russian officials present for their using the term Eurasia and even the term Greater Eurasia. Here's what he said, quote, I have many maps, but none of them depicts anything called Greater Eurasia. And he continued, show me where it is. What I do know is Central Asia, which includes Afghanistan. I know we have common interests, common understandings, common values, a common history, and a common culture. I also know that we Central Asians know each other far better than outsiders know us. That's that's. President Nazarbayev, speaking for the region, including Afghanistan. This awareness has led to many region-wide initiatives. Intra-regional trade is soaring, with trade between Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan having doubled in a year. Uzbekistan provides electricity to Kabul, and impoverished Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan are selling hydroelectric energy to Pakistan. On its own, gas-rich Turkmenistan is advancing a, 
a pipeline clear across Afghanistan to Pakistan and India. This is being done after U.S. oil majors dropped the project four years ago because there was no support from the White House. Afghan businessmen from relatively peaceful Mazari Sharif and Herat are to be seen in Central Asian capitals these days. In June of this year, the UN General Assembly passed a resolution supporting the emergence of Central Asia as a region capable of taking charge of its own economic and social development and, very significantly, of its own security without the interference of outsiders. And by the way, China supported this and Russia supported it, worth remembering. Let us assume then that Central Asia has, in some sense, uh, constitutes a single entity. But how can it be organized to reflect that reality? This is a question that Central, Asians leaders, Central Asia's leaders are now pondering. As they grope toward forming a new regional organization, they are looking for guidance to foreign models like the Nordic Council, America Sur, and above all, ASEAN, an impressively Im successful intergovernmental agency comprised of seven uh, of 10 Southeast Asian countries. Interesting, one of Asia's leading diplomats, Singapore's Bilahari Khan, points out that even after half a century, ASEAN countries have far, far less in common with each other than do Central Asians today. So, after reviewing these developments, finally, let me ask, how is Russia responding to all this activity? Mr. Putin may aspire to rebuild the empire, but so far he has been unsure how to handle Central Asia's new activism. True, Russia voted in support of the UN's pro-Central Asia res resolution, but so did China. On the international front, Putin regularly warns anyone who will listen, did this twice in the last month, um, uh, that uh, Central Asia and especially Kazakhstan are part of what he brazenly claims as Russia's zone of privileged interest, and they should stay out. But he has yet to back such threats with action. Foreign Minister Lavrov has grudgingly accepted America's C5 plus one, it should be two, C5 plus two, including Afghanistan. It's a big mistake Kerry made by not including Afghanistan. It, the, uh, the Central Asians want this corrected fast. Uh, the, the, he grudgingly accepted America's C5 plus one, a pro pro program that I recommended uh, a decade ago. But he has also claimed that America is trying to create a, quote, greater Central Asia under Washington's control, as purportedly proposed by yours truly in Foreign Affairs in 2008. This accusation was based not on original research by Lavrov's staff, however, but on a nearly identical uh, article in China's People's Daily several years ago. I should candidly state that the purpose of my article was mainly to identify the broad cultural zone to which all the so-called stands belong and not to claim out a new zone of influence for the US. And I know of no such plot by the State Department. I question whether they're capable of pulling it off. <laughs> so, is all this bluster? What is Russia really prepared to do? And how will it justify a hostile response when the Central Asians themselves insist on maintaining peaceful and positive relations with all foreign powers? Russia is passive for now, but one must assume that zealots in Moscow, of which there are, are all too many, could eventually push the Kremlin into a more aggressive policy to counter Central Asia's ever more visible thrust for self-government. Expect a reversion then to classic divide and rule policies. To now, Russia has entered my story only as, only as a subject, as a force acting or not acting upon others. But in conclusion, let me now turn the table and consider the degree to which Russia has become, with respect to Central Asia, a land that is itself being acted upon and is being influenced and shaped by its neighbors to the south. First, let us consider the demography. From four to eight million Central Asian laborers, probably closer to eight, mainly 
but not solely from Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan, are working in Russia today. Their departure for the North relieves Central Asian countries of excess labor and has resulted for now in ample remission sent to families back home. Most of these workers talk of returning home someday, but few will ever do so. Hundreds of thousands of the men have taken new wives and acquired property in Russia. These immigrants have already had a profound impact on Russia. The outflow of Russians from rural regions of ancient Muscovy has left vast tracts of good land to be worked by Uzbek farmers. This is in the traditional Russian heartland, ruled, worked by Uzbek farmers. Most immigrants, however, flock to cities and small towns. Moscow's Muslim population is now two million. Uh, officially, it's probably closer to three, making it a larger center of Muslim life than Astana in Kazakhstan, Bishkek in Kyrgyzstan, Dushanbe in Tajikistan, uh, or Ashgabat in Turkmenistan. The only Central Asian capitals that surpass it are Kabul and Tashkent, but Moscow may soon surpass Tash Tashkent. The city now has 16 mosques and whole neighborhoods that seem to have been magically transplanted from Osh or Hojent. These immigrants supplement Russia's indigenous Muslims, most of whom are Turkic, Volga Tartars and various groups in the, from the North Caucasus. As a result of an increasing percentage of both contract and conscripts, <coughs> a conscript re recruits to the Russian army are as a result, an increasing percentage of both contract and conscript re recruits to the Russian army are Turkic, mainly immigrants from Central Asia, Azerbaijan, and the Caucasus who receive bonuses and access to Russian citizenship for serving. Even in Tsarist times, it must be acknowledged, the Russian army found a place for Muslims. But the current situation is different as the number of such troops who are immigrants increases. If Russia should plan a military adventure in Central Asia, Will tr Turkic troops from the region fight their relatives? Finally, a third of all inmates of Russian prisons are Turkic. As the political, in the political realm, Putin might have reason to worry that if the reforms in Uzbekistan and possibly elsewhere in Central Asia gain sufficient momentum, they will attract the attention of Russians who might call for the same kind of reforms at home. Whether or not that happens, will Russia's growing Turkic and Muslim population stay as quiescent as it has been in recent years? And in the long run, won't the sheer number of immigrants from Central Asia and the Caucasus force Russia to decide whether it wants to continue the base policy on ethnic and cultural preservation or switch to a system defined by citizenship Inde uh, that is independent of identity. With regards to Central Asia itself, President Putin has tried to impose various economic and security organizations controlled by Moscow. But the Central Asians have responded coolly and typically adroitly. To the extent that the six countries come to function as a region, <coughs> Russia's old divide and rule methods may no, no longer work. Coordination among Central Asians has, could have the effect of constraining Russia's freedom of action. Even if Central Asian countries choose to enter into institutions sponsored by Moscow, greater coordination among them would mean that the Central Asian members would be more effective in those organizations in asserting their own interests. This already frustrates Moscow, as is evident from the fact that its generals excluded e, uh, um, EEU and CSO, uh, CSCO members, member Kazakhstan, from last month's massive Vostok 2018 war games. They excluded the Kazakhs. Finally, a note on the US, Europe, and Japan, and other economically developed and, and, and democratic countries. If they come to view regional cooperation in Central Asia as a positive step, they will be more protective of the countries 
and institutions that define it. Similarly, this successful implementation of the reform program in the successful implementation of the reform program in Uzbekistan will inevitably cause them to support that country and the region as a whole more actively than has heretofore been the case. This, too, will limit Putin's freedom of action in Central Asia. Finally, the rise of east-west continental trade through Central Asia will engage both Europe and China in the region's stability and welfare. And I should add, there's a two-week-long conference on S Central Asia and India just about to take place or taking place. That is opening up the door to the south. And that will give India equal and Pakistan equal interest in, in Central Asia as such. One can hope that during the coming years, Russia will evolve as positively as some of its former colonial subjects in Central Asia. If that happens, the transition that has now begun can go forward smoothly and to the benefit of all involved. If not, however, Russia will face a serious dilemma. Either it barges forward with its president, present neo-imperial strategy toward the region, or it adopts a, po a posture that is less paranoid and more accepting of the sovereignties and aspirations of others. However, to renounce empire as the organizing principle of the Russian state and its policies means massive, even revolutionary changes in the very fiber of the state and society. Yet there is a more pacific path open to Russia. Moscow claims that its <coughs> Moscow claims that it, it that its demand for a zone of privileged interest in Central Asia is motivated mainly by security concerns. If this is really so, Moscow should embrace self-determination for that region as far the most likely means of reducing extremism, quelling drug trafficking, and stamping out corruption. To, uh, to the extent this happens, our story can have a happy ending. If not, Russia will become increasingly Central Asia's near abroad, seeking to protect its own security at the expense of the insecurity of, of what will become its increasingly alienated neighbors to the south. Let us hope that Mr. Putin's successor, if not Putin himself, chooses the, latter, the former course. Either way, Putin and his ministers are now facing a Central Asia that is undergoing its biggest change since the Russian conquest and before that, Tamerlane. It's time, I think, for Putin and his friends to acknowledge this. Thank you. Thank you very much, Fred. Uh, we'll open it up uh, in a moment. Um, I want to begin with one question here. Um, in what was just a fascinating and comprehensive talk, I think you men mentioned China once, maybe twice. So as we talked about Russia's decreased influence and inability to assert its traditional empire and empire values into Central Asia, to what extent now is China the counterbalance that prevents that from happening? It, it, it is, but China's constraints in Central Asia are far more significant than we've acknowledged. Um, the One Belt, One Road initiative, if you look at maps, my colleague uh, uh, Mamuka Saratelli has pointed this out to me, if you look at maps issued by the Chinese across Central Asia and the Caucasus, you will see many roads and routes on the Chinese maps that imply that these were funded and done by the Chinese, so they were locally funded. Turkmenistan funded all the road and railroad all clear across the country and its new port. Azerbaijan founded its new port itself. Uh, Kazakhstan, yes, they've gotten a lot of money, but they've also poured huge amounts of their own resources into this. So every, they're well, the locals in Central Asia are well aware uh, who's paying, that they're, that, that they're paying some of the bills too, point one. Point two, 
you can't get to Central Asia from heartland China without crossing the Turkic Muslim province of Xinjiang. And you know what's finally the, even the Washington Post has started covering this story. It, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very, very important issue. We did a book on this a number of years ago. Uh, it, why is this important? Because Urumqi, which is the capital of Xinjiang, is, is a, it's always been a Chinese city. It was never a, a big Turkic center. Kashgar, however, where the new road goes and where all everything fans out from, is one of the it is the most ancient Turkic capital. Far in the Uyghurs had a written language, they had they had a literature, they had urban life, they had continental trade long before uh, any other Turkic people did. And Kashgar is being destroyed as we're sitting here. There's not one piece in, in major Western press about this. It is being replaced with a modern, very slick Chinese city. And a few fragments of old Kashgar are being preserved as a kind of Disneyland. Uh, everyone in Central no Asia knows this. They know that when they signed up for the SCO, the new head of which, by the way, is an Uzbek, um, that when they signed up for the SB SCO, they had to sign on the line that we will not allow anyone on our territory, whether foreign or uh, our own citizen, to do or say anything against China in Xinjiang. And, the, and each of these countries initially either turned over or prosecuted either their own citizens for, for doing this. This was a... This was, I think China overplayed its hand. Everyone knows this is the case. So, so there's, a, there's a very prudent attitude in Central Asia and the Caucasus for, uh, with regard to China. Very, very savvy, very calm. They're, they maintain very cordial relations. Um, that constrains them. And, and what I'm saying is that, yes, Russia does constrain, China, uh, China does constrain Russia, but uh, as Gorbachev used to say, life itself has created some constraints on China's actions in Central Asia that I believe are far more important than have been acknowledged. Thanks so much. So we're going to open the floor for questions. Um, we'll start in the back. And I'm sure we're going to have a lot of questions, so please, a question and not a long statement. Sure. Uh, hi, my name is Alex Sanchez. I'm an analyst here in Washington, D.C. One question. I was wondering if you can talk more about the Caspian Sea dispute. There was a uh, summit maybe like two months ago in, yeah. in Kazakhstan. The, the agreement that has come up, it seems to be like the, the blueprint for a final resolution. Uh, what is your, what's your opinion about it? Thank you. Yeah, a very, very important point. The, historically, the Caspian has been a barrier to east-west trade. Uh, and uh, there, I could go into ancient history. There was a period when it wasn't, by the way, when you could get take the Amur Darya all the way to the Sea of Azov and the Sea of uh, and it can, er, all the way to to the what's the port uh, sea that's drying up. Arrow sea. Arrow, you could take you could take a, a boat all the way from basically Afghanistan to Caspian through the Aral Sea. Uh, that was very short lived. But Caspian has been a barrier to East West trade, and and there was practically none during Soviet times East West trade across across the Caspian. Now the Cossacks have been built three ports. The Turkmen are building a huge port, Turkmenbashi, Turkish labor. And, uh, and the, and the uh, uh, Azeris are, are well along com toward completing a port. Then you have the Georgians building this enormous new uh, 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 deep sea uh, uh, port uh, 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 on the Black Sea. Suddenly, east-west transport is coming real. And the agreement the other week, Russia was so intent on getting uh, of making sure the United States didn't create an, an army base in Kazakhstan or, or in, in, in Azerbaijan, which no one has ever contemplated, 
they were so intent on that that they were willing to trade that for a relaxing of the east-west rules and I, th I think pipelines are going to spring up transport is already springing up uh, east-west and as that happens that if any attempt to interrupt that 10 years from now it, you know when when Putin attacked Georgia the only people that picked up the phone were, were the president of France who didn't have much to say and President Bush who said we're sending in we're sending in uh, uh, humanitarian assistance, and by the way, it's coming in military planes. Well, Putin didn't believe that it was humanitarian assistance, and that's when he backed off. My point is, it, 10 years from now, because of what this agreement re removes some of the impediments to this east-west transport and uh, trade, because it did that, opened up that possibility, if there was an attack on the Caucasus or Central Asia 10 years from now, it won't be just uh, presidents of France and of U.S. picking up the phone. You'll have everyone from China all across Europe uh, raising a little hell about it. So that really changed. This is a fundamental change from north-south to east-west. I'm going to take these. Th we're going to take three questions right now. So here, and then here, and then here. So right down here. Um, I actually, uh, if I may, had um, uh, a comment rather than a question. First, I wanted Wait. to thank you for that extraordinarily elegant presentation, all the work you've done on Central Asia over the years. Um, specifically, I just wanted to comment on the issue of the the, the Afghan pipeline and Turkmenistan, having uh, written many cables back to Washington when I was ambassador there, um, and then uh, again when I was charge back in uh, briefly in 2014. Um, but uh, my sense always was it wasn't that the White House or the State Department didn't support it. Indeed, there would be many, many reasons. Um, uh, for such a pipeline, uh, and increasingly the State Department was focused on Central Asia and supporting uh, Afghanistan and so on, but we could never get the Turkmen, uh, one, to give any equity stakes to uh, Western oil companies. I saw both Chevron and ExxonMobil come in and leave. Uh, also, there's the whole issue of the market not being able to secure um, uh, you know, a market price uh, in Pakistan and India. So, I mean, it's a complicated topic, but I, I don't think it was because there was any animus uh, from the White House. Indeed, it would have made so much strategic sense, but um, just market forces just didn't line up and we're not a statist economy the way China is, which was able to, in effect, um, you know, build those pipelines. Anyhow, thank you. Okay, and we had a question here, and we had the question down here. So two more questions, and then we'll let Professor Stark respond. Hi, uh, John Lechner. I'm also an analyst here in uh, D.C. I, I had a quick question um, on your thoughts on Turkey and uh, what role Turkey might have to play in Central Asia in the future, um, especially just given the common culture and heritage that a lot of uh, Turks share. Good. Okay, and there was a question right here. Um, hello, uh, my name is David Kepsi. I'm intern at the Cato Institute. Um, my question to you is, uh, how do you believe um, Russia's history in Afghanistan, particularly the bloody war that they fought there, uh, affects its current relationship with uh, Central Asia and Furthermore, how do you think uh, its current treatment of its domestic Muslim population, particularly in the Chechnyan region, uh, might affect its relationship with uh, Muslims uh, in Russia and the area around it, uh, surrounding it? Good. Go Let me address your comment first. Uh, sitting behind you is Abdul Salam Mamandanzarov, who uh, was a brilliant translator, linguist, uh, 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 from Tajikistan, who was called up the night before the Soviet invasion, and he, he, his linguistic skills were needed, and so they threw him in the tank, and he went, woke uh, the next morning and w went the next day to Kabul. Uh, he, I think he knows better than and probably anyone in the room 
the complexities of the Russian experience there. The Afghans have no illusions about this. The, this the, the, again, people, I, I, I'm, I've said several times in my presentation, Central Asians are more subtle than we think. And, and they also have certain traditions of politeness, so they don't have to rub your nose in it. Uh, uh, they know what's going on, and and Russia is really constrained in Afghanistan. To give you an example, the Central Asians as a group, including Afghanistan, uh, agreed at their conference that they would become a venue for serious talks between the Taliban, the government, and and uh, uh, external powers. Um, and Russia uh, uh, immediately stepped in and said, no, we'll do this, we'll have these, great, great idea, we'll do it in Moscow. Ghani, after consulting with all the Central Asian presidents, picked up the phone and, and called Putin and said, no, you're not, and they backed off. And I mean, this, th this exactly epitomizes the kind of development I'm saying is taking place. They all were on board for that rebuttal. Um, now, as to Turkey, very interesting question. Uh, after the collapse of the, U well, before the collapse of the USSR, there, the Turks had really, thanks to Ataturk, had, had forgotten about all these folks. And they said, look, let's build up Turkey. And for the first time in history, we Turks have our own country. Let's build it up and forget about these guys to the east. When 91 came, collapse of the USSR, the thinking in Turkey was, uh, well, our little brothers, we're, we'll go and bring them culture and civilization. And, and, and they opened up scholarships and so on, and the Central Asians came and went to Turkic, Turkish universities and said, well, you know, these aren't as good as ours. And, and in general, there was a big, big reaction against it. Uh, the Turks really played this, uh, and they overplayed it. And then with Erdogan today, and if you follow our website, Turkey, turkeyanalyst.org, you'll see some of the, the best writing on, on the Turkey today. It's being done by several of the regular contributors. Uh, what it shows is that Central Asians today are highly, are very, very cautious, as are Azeris, by, even Azeris, uh, very cautious about the religious direction that Erdogan is taking and, and some of his economic policies, too, which are kind of nutty. So they, yes, trade is very important, and there, yes, there are still Tur major Turkish firms who are very active across Central Asia, and they've played, done some very positive things. There also have been more than a few uh, 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 examples of r Turkish corruption in Central Asia, which have led to massive lawsuits. And, and so, and, and then you add on all this, the, the uh, attack on the Gulen movement. Uh, there is, after all, a Gulen University, and there was in Kyrgyzstan, there are schools in Tajikistan and Kyrgyzstan and, and so on. And, and so it, it's become very complicated, but again, the Central Asians and the Azeris and the Georgians are handling all this very subtly. They, they, they are, they are. Uh, maintaining correct relations. It's not easy, but they're doing it, and they're, and they're getting the benefit they see from this relationship and trying to avoid the negative. Now, on, on the uh, uh, TAPI pipeline, uh, I think we fundamentally disagree about this. Uh, I uh, have followed on the Turkmen side very closely. Uh, I know that the American firms wanted onshore rights. That was why they were willing to do this. And, and for reasons that are, uh, <laughs> you know very well, and we, we both have heard a lot about, they don't want that. They, they weren't prepared to do that. This was not a bargaining chip. And, and in the end, though, to their credit, Chevron came up with a proposal that looked that the that the Turkmen were were ready to go with, but they said, "Wait a minute! When we did a pipeline to Russia, uh, to China, 
Hu Jintao came here twice. Um, we, we need stronger certification from you. And at that point, um, the proposal was to get the Secretary of State there. Well, you know she wrote a letter, uh, Hillary Clinton, but the, it didn't show in person. And more serious, the, the Turkmen said, look, we'll have a deal if, if the president shows. But there was not a word from the White House. And I went to the Turkmen. I went to, to people in the foreign ministry and said, I would like to know what could the U.S. do that will enable you to sign this deal? And they said, we need a, a statement of engagement, commitment from the White House. I drafted such a letter, sent it to the State Department. They blew it off. There was never a, a response from the White House. And at that point, the Turkmen withdrew. And that was all I wrote about in the Wall Street Journal. So I, I look, your, your points are absolutely correct. Uh, they aren't market thinking, uh, but, uh, and, and, and the, the two American majors both gave it a very serious a, a, a try, and you guys in the embassy did too. And, and uh, there was a lot of blame to go around, uh, but it is moving forward today, uh, not, not in leaps and bounds, but it is moving forward, and, and they've found fun financing in unlikely places, and, 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 uh, uh, and uh, they are rather uh, interesting. Uh, think of what this means. It's another east-west route. It is, it is the southern corridor that, for, you know, we think of the Silk Road, China, Europe. No, it was much less significant. It's not as old as the India-Europe route. It's not as long. It was it, uh, the India-Europe route carried many more goods in both directions. It was never interrupted. The Silk Chinese Silk Road was on again, off again. Uh, this, this promises to be one of the factors opening up as, uh, the, the, this southern corridor. I think it's extreme, strategically it's extremely important, and I think we, we should be pushing for it today again, and we should be helping, but we're not. Okay, so I see four questions. So these four hands here. So Jerry, then there, then here, then here. We'll try to get one more question here, and then we'll, we'll let Dr. Professor Starr answer what he wants to answer. Thank you. Uh, Jerry Hyman at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. Thank you for a very impressive and broad, comprehensive talk. I wonder if you could say a bit more, although I realize this is the subject for many talks, not just a comment or response, about the domestic political development of the Central Asian Republics, which is a stumbling block in ASEAN, the disparate um, domestic political, economic, security interests of the relevant, of the respective member states. Okay, right here. Everyone keep their hands up for me, I'm looking for okay. here. Okay, go ahead. Sebastian Pirou, Central Asia Program, George Washington University. Thank you so much, Fred, for your, for your in extremely interesting presentation. Uh, you mentioned in your presentation that uh, while well, we have, there are many migrants, in uh, Central Asian migrants working in Russia, actually, yes, there are millions of migrants working there. So my question would be, how do you assess the role of these migrants in connecting or reconnecting Russia with Central Asia? I'm asking this question, actually, because whatever we like that or not, uh, in all the opinion, opinion polls done in Central Asia, Russia is viewed as a favorite partner by, by Central Asian people. I mean, Central Asian people uh, admire Russia much more than they would admire any other country in the world, the United States or uh, the European Union or any other country. So I would be happy to have your opinion on that. Thank you. Okay. We had questions there, there, and okay, quick questions here, then. My name is John Papathiofanis. I'm a graduate student at Johns Hopkins University. Uh, my question is regarding <laughs> my question is regarding uh, the autonomous regions of Karakal, Pakistan, and Gorno Badakhshan. Uh, more specifically, how um, Russia could leverage the political movements there, the political separatist movements there, uh, and just general regional security concerns that yeah. might derive from those. Good. Okay. Right here? Yeah, Ken Meyer, Gord. 
Uh, it's become popular amongst our geostrategists to refer to our engagement in Afghanistan as a generational war, meaning the sons and perhaps grandsons of those that are fighting there now will be fighting there still. How does that fit in with your scenario? Okay. You okay. mean a multi-generational? Yeah. I think that's what they mean. Okay. Right here. Tom Boyer, lawyer. Uh, further, Will, Lee, Will's question about Russia and China and their relationship in Central Asia. What should U.S. policy be toward these two countries, favoring uh, one or the other or even-handed? Very good. A fine wrap-up question there to uh, wow. end the round. Very good. <laughs> well, I, th you've given me wonderful opportunities to make a fool of myself, <laughs> and I, I'll now take advantage of that. <laughs> Uh, these are real questions, and I, uh, I, I really salute you and salute you for uh, this wonderful audience. Um, first of all, the domestic the political question, uh, the differences among them. I mean, uh, Uzbekistan has done a dramatic flip-flop. We'll see. I mean, this is, these are all just legislative acts or decrees at this point. Uh, presidential decrees. They, uh, now we'll, we enter the implementation phase and we'll see how much is implemented. Uh, one can ask about uh, is Newton's third law relevant here? Is it, does every action produce an equal and opposite reaction? That's a relevant question. We, it's too early to say. But there is something very serious happening in Uzbekistan. And, and it, is, it is in a direction which we should favor and we do. Uh, I think it's inevitable that, they, that, that the other countries will be affected by this. They already have, uh, and I've, I've seen this very close up. Even Turkmenistan, you know, Turkmenistan carved out a very, very, <laughs> if I use it politely, a distinctive uh, posture. Uh, uh, but, but let me just say that when... Turkmenistan was proposing the pipeline, and they proposed it, not the Chinese. The Chinese pipeline was initiated in Ashgabat. Uh, when they proposed this, they had a stumbling block, namely bad relations with Uzbeks, and it had to cross Uzbekistan. And, and Turkmen and Uzbeks had been killing each other for 400 years. And, and yet, when push came to shove, and they both saw the practical need for resolving that, it took them two weeks. And they haven't reverted. <laughs> so I, I, I don't think we should underestimate the possibility of rapid shifts uh, and even rapid peaceful shifts in this part of the world. But you're right that there are real differences among them and these, these could, uh, uh, in their political systems, and these could become impediments. I'm, let's watch that, but I'm fairly optimistic. Second, uh, the... the uh, Migrants, uh, I, 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 this is a much studied subject, um, but it, uh, I, I think what hasn't been done is to compare this to migration, other major migrations. I, a lot of Sicilians lo uh, uh, who came to America in the 18, what, uh, 70s, 80s, 90s, uh, they were going back and forth for a generation or so, and in large numbers. Uh, and and yet, at a certain point, you know, it was an end, and 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 they settled in their new country and became deeply American. Um, uh, I, I think the the processes here are going to favor uh, 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 assimilation in Russia, but the assimilation produces change. And, and uh, I, I think the, the uh, I, I, think, I, I think this is a far more fundamental shift in Russian culture than we've acknowledged. If they were all concentrated in a few areas, it'd be easy to deal with. You'd make, make several territories or new countries or whatever, but they're not. They're spread all over the place, and, and more are still, still coming. So that, that, that's going to be interesting. There, now, the question uh, on about, about Russians, I, I, you're right. Uh, there is a, 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 I mean, 
still bombardment 24-7 of Russian TV, of Russian news media, and, and there have been a lot of contact and so on. That said, Russia is not the major investor in this region. Uh, and, the, and the firms that are don't always come up with the best reputation. I look at the aluminum approach to Tajikistan, where, where they sent Deripaska down, and he was sent down. It, uh, it was not done just as an autonomous business move to take over the, the, the uh, Tajik uh, hydroelectric capacity in, in order to produce aluminum there. And, and the Tajiks basically sent him home. Um, now... I would also note that a lot of the observations on the status of Russia in Central Asia are the result of conversations between Russian-speaking Westerners and Russian-speaking locals. They are, you often get very different conversations when you're in, a, in the local languages. And, and, and so I think this is a real distortion that, we, uh, that has very significant implications for American edu educational institutions and in how they study this part of the world. You need local languages now. You can't do it through Russian alone. That time has passed. And there are all sorts of things appearing in the local press that are not translated and that are very different from what are, that might be printed in the, in the more Russian-oriented press. The Badakhshan and Karakampakhstan, that's, you have a Badakhshani sitting behind you here. <laughs> uh, I've, I've been to his house. <laughs> I, I, I've examined the, the, the beautiful carved woodwork around the windows that his brother did. Uh, uh, this is, <coughs> <coughs> I don't want to attempt to answer this. This is a very complex matter. It is not a Russian matter, particularly, any more, but uh, far less is it than the Russian messing around in Western Uzbekistan today. That is, it, it, no one else is doing it. it. It is not an indigenous problem. It is basically Russian messing with Uzbeks. And, and the, 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 the Uzbeks from Karakapalkistan have, have their own institutions, they have ministries of their own and so on. They've been given a fair degree of autonomy and I think they'll get a lot more under the new, under the new uh, administration in Uzbekistan. But that, I, I, I view that as a Russian gambit, purely. Uh, the, the, the issue in, in, in Badakhshan is profoundly deeper uh, in that you're dealing with Ismailis whom, uh, w who were driven there by the Sunni majority, uh, who rejected them not only as Shia, which they are, but also rejected them as, as, as not Muslim. And you have simultaneously across the border, remember there's Afghan Badakhshan, and then you have this large number of, of Ismailis in northern Pakistan. We, we've traveled on that. <laughs> we've, we've, every, every up and down we've done, been. And those, those, those Ismailis up there are today under tremendous pressure from the Muslim, Shi Sunni Muslim majority, which is very much still getting the message from these foundations based in the Middle East that have poured so much money into fundamentalism into, through the entire region. This is a profound cultural conflict taking and religious conflict taking place. And at a certain point, yes, I think everyone's going to have to decide wh uh, uh, who, who are we, whom are we going to help on this. Um, uh, now, on uh, the generational war, Oh, R Russians in Afghanistan, well, that's perfectly obvious that, that I spoke about that. Okay, the, the, let me uh, turn right to the generational issue. Yes, of course, the, this is, this is a, a, a cultural war taking place there, and it has to do with this larger developments within Islam. And, uh, you know, there are, uh, the Afghans are, are, are Hanafi, the, of the four legal systems in, in Islam, this is the far the most moderate. I mean, if you, if you read their, their laws, there's some pretty tough stuff there, to be sure, very. But it's a lot milder than the others. And, and they are traditionally Hanafi and, and, and not 
among the fanatics and zealots. And, and, but, but there are so many pressures from uh, so how many, 18 f foreign organizations working on their territory today. It, 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 it's a touch and go. You have this remarkable young generation of young Afghans, re really as modern as anyone, uh, any of your sons or daughters. Uh, <laughs> they're really good. They're really good. Uh, and, uh, and the question is, will they prevail or will these pressures largely from the outside prevail? And now in the most recent, recent iteration, we're talking about a southern Afghanistan with Pakistan try, uh, influencing and controlling it and a nor northern pa Afghanistan that is interacting with the rest of Central Asia. Who knows how that'll all work out? My point is this the fundamental driver it has to it, it remains a evolution toward radicalism within parts of the Sunni Muslim community, and that is the main driver, and and that gets passed on until it burns its until this fire burns itself out. Um, uh, Russia and China. Look, uh, I think we 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 were so surprised at their their. Uh, uh, professions of eternal amity and friendship, and, and in recent weeks and months, th this has actually increased somewhat. However, do not think this is anything like an equal partnership, or that they don't, aren't fully aware, each of them, of their own interests. I was a director of a big Russian oil company, Sedanko, uh, at the time that the Chinese, we were talking with PetroChina about building pipeline from from, from uh, the area around Irkutsk uh, and the great Kavitka uh, gas field and the oil <laughs> fields up there, enormous stuff, uh, all the way to China. And, and, and it, we were in very intense dealings with Putin and the, and the Russian White House. Uh, I, there was no friendship, no amity in those negotiations at all. And when Putin finally finally uh, uh, got uh, into his trouble with the Europeans and turned around the next day and, and pleaded with the Chinese for any kind of a deal. Uh, uh, they, they really hung him out to dry. And one of the Chinese guys that we'd been in touch with back then, 10, 10 15 years ago, phoned me up and sa said, you won't believe what Putin <laughs> settled for. <laughs> you know, he was just giggling with, with delight at the, at the low, at the low uh, price that, the, uh, that they'd snookered the Russians into. But so, so I, I think we can overstate this. I think we should treat the, their I interests and activities in Central Asia as purely two separate countries. And, and uh, uh, we should, we should uh, welcome them when they're constructive and, 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 and stand with the Central Asians when they're not. The, the issue here is, is there going to be a sovereign and self-governing region called Central Asia or not? And, and uh, that's going to be decided in the next few years. It's a very important issue. We should come out uh, 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 solidly in behalf of it. Well, uh, I want to thank Professor Starr for just a very informative and excellent talk. I think he has again reminded us what is the mission of the Kennan Institute and what it's like to bring deep knowledge and understanding of a region to better inform our current policy affairs. So thank you so much, Professor Starr.